So I am actually really excited for this video. Uh, this is a project that I have been working on for several weeks now. So the goal of this project is I wanted to show you guys who might be engineering students or high school students or you know uh, someone who does not have very much money I wanted to show you how to build a PC for very cheap or reasonably cheap that can help you get your work done whether it's programming or some light SolidWorks 3D modeling I wanted to to show you how to build a computer that's going to help you with your workflow and is not going to break the bank. Obviously it's going to be a desktop because desktops give you more performance per dollar as opposed to laptops where you pay a premium for portability. But you know, people are working at home nowadays so having a desktop isn't that unreasonable. Um, we're just going to be doing the tower, not monitors and keyboards because, I mean, you know, you can get those on your own. but. I wanted to lay the groundwork for how uh, to build an engineering PC for a reasonable price. Now a few things about this video. Uh, this is going to assume that you already know how to build a PC, um, that you might have a few parts laying around, um, you know, we'll, we'll discuss if you're going to get everything, where to get everything of course, but you know, the more parts that you already have available, the better. Uh, it's also going to assume that you know um, what PC components you're going to need for your particular workflow. So, you know, you're going to have to, to know what is going to suit your needs best. So, uh, let's go ahead and get started because today I got the final piece in the mail and this is the first part that we're going to be going over. So, let's get to it. This is our motherboard. And they put it in a nice anti-static bag too. And uh, just in case you're curious, if you look on the back, they included the IO shield, which is awesome. Very happy for that. So this is going to be our main platform for our new build. So I'm gonna get this out of the bag and then we will talk about it. So this is the ASUS P8 Z77 motherboard. Um, this motherboard was released right around 2012, 2013, and it's going to be our base platform for this build. Um, we are gonna be going with an older Intel chip, um, and we'll show you that in a minute. So just a little bit about this board. Now, one thing to note about this board is that in its day, this was almost one of the top of the line motherboards you could have. This was considered fairly enthusiast level at the time. Um, there was a deluxe edition that had a few more enthusiast features, you know, like an LED on the bottom to tell you your temperature and stuff, um, onboard power button, things things that you know really were more enthusiast level, but you know, things like having eight SATA connectors, I think um, one of these can be, uh, two of these can be used for like uh, caching your hard drive with an SSD or something like that. And um, things like onboard uh, display port and HDMI. You know, a lot of these features were very much ahead of its time. You know, you got your VRM if you want to do some overclocking. So this was a very, very high end board for 2012 and 2013. But uh, yeah, uh, you know, you got a bunch of. PCI Express slots that can fit all kinds of cards that you need. Um, of course, the only one we're going to really be needing is this top one because, spoiler alert, we're going to have a graphics card in here. So yeah, that's just a little bit about the board. Oh, at the time, at the time it should be noted, uh, it does have USB 3.0 and that was, that was very, very ahead of the time. I think it was just starting to become more consumer level back then, but yeah. So, I mean, 2012, 2013, you know, to give you some context, that's when, like, if you had, like, a 160 gig or a 240 gig SSD, that was pretty extreme. You know, SSDs were a brand new technology. Um, you know, hard drives were still very much the norm. So, the fact that it has all these features 
is pretty incredible. Or at least it was back then. But it's going to definitely serve our uses today. I actually got this on eBay for $80 shipped. And I'm actually kind of left pretty speechless because the listing said that this was pulled out of a working machine and that it worked. And if you told me that this was like new old stock, I would have believed you because there is basically zero dust on this thing. They even have the CPU socket cover, which is incredible. Um, you do know, just for those of you out there, just an FYI, if you have a motherboard and you're planning to resell it, keep this um, piece, uh, CPU cover on because it's what's going to protect your socket from getting scratches and bending the pins and everything. And it's just very, very good practice to have that uh, if you ever want to resell it. So just keep that in mind. But um, I'm actually very, very impressed at the condition that this thing is in. So uh, $80 well spent, I think. One of the other motherboard options that I was considering uh, was an old HP board that had a Xeon in it off eBay. Uh, the boards are about 60 bucks, and the uh, Xeons are about $30 a pop for a total of $90. And I thought that that was a, a, a great idea because, you know, being a Xeon, it gives you access to ECC memory, error crypting memory, which if you're programming, that is fantastic to have because it really helps with debugging. And, you know, if, uh, if you're learning C and assembly and lower level languages where you have to learn about memory management, you know, ECC memory is going to make it so that you might not, you know, crash your system if you have a loose pointer or you haven't, you know, deallocated your memory or something like that. So that was very useful. Also, Xeons have more cache, uh, more cores, and they do have hyper threading. Uh, they run at lower clock speeds, so they're more energy efficient. There are a lot of reasons why you would want to consider a Xeon uh, for work. You know, they're in a lot of workstations. Uh, the issue with that particular board uh, was HP OEMs are just terrible, I guess. And uh, the power connector and a lot of the pinouts for like fans and things like that were proprietary. And the board would not function, or at least it would throw an error uh, if it did not sense those that were in the original system. So you were pretty much forced to just buy the actual system. That's how they kind of kept you in check there. So it wasn't really worth it and it was probably better to just uh, splurge on the extra money for the um, uh, Core i series motherboard like we did here, the more consumer grade one. Um, but you know if you can get those adapters and you can short those pins, you could probably mod it to work. But when I made this video I specifically wanted to do something that was going to be relatively easy to set up. You know, you didn't have to be a computer geek to, to set it up. I mean, you had to have a little bit of knowledge, but I didn't want some people to come in here and be like, I have to do what? I have to mod? This is like more hacky than building a PC. And I didn't want it to feel that way. And then uh, for normal consumer level Xeon boards, it was either uh, find one at an extremely inflated price. Old uh, X79 or X99 boards are really pricey if you want to get them complete in box. Um, there is an option to get some sketchy ones from China, um, but they're going to take forever and, you know, they're running a hacked BIOS and you just never know if compatibility is going to work or not because it's it's all really a crapshoot at that point because, um, you know, the chipsets are recycled and everything and, like I said, the BIOS is just, like, thrown together at Frankenstein, so... You know, it, it's really, you know, go at your own risk. And it's it's a, it's really a balancing act of what do I want in terms of performance versus how much money I'm willing to spend. So it's all a balancing act. Do your research, like I said. Um, but yeah, we're just going with the consumer board for now. So we've gone over the motherboard. Now let's talk about what we're going to put in it. So here I have the processor. This is the i7-3770. non Okay, so we're not going to be overclocking this thing, and the reasons why is twofold. So with a locked processor, we're going to get much better uh, power efficiency, um, which, you know, we're engineers, we're making an engineering PC. You want it to be as efficient as possible. 
And then also it's going to cut down on costs because the overclocking headroom that some of these i7s had uh, makes them retain their value better. So this will be a much better option. Uh, I was debating between this and an i7-2600, also non-K, um, because they are the same socket and they would both fit into that board. The 2600 non-K will run you about $75. This particular one, also non-K, will run you about $90. Um, you know, these i7s, uh, they do hold their value. I'm not gonna lie, you know, you got four cores, eight threads, I believe eight megabytes of cache, um, you know, 3.4 gigahertz. These can turbo up to close to four um, under load. So, you know, you get a lot of CPU for your money. Um, they're not gonna compare obviously to today's, you know, eight 16 core processors, obviously, but especially for the time and still today, they do hold their own. So that's really what we wanted. Um, again, those Xeons would have been nice for compiling code, but with eight threads, that's still gonna be a pretty snappy machine. Um, if you're doing any kind of video editing or 3D work, you know, it, it's not gonna hold you back that much. I mean, you're not doing anything like really industrial. It's probably, you know, more college design stuff. So this will be perfectly fine for you. Um, very, very good for the money. Uh, just, you know, see what fits into your budget. If you need to step down, if you don't need a lot of CPU horsepower, you might wanna go down to an i5 you know, those will run you about 40 to $50 uh, if you get them loose. Um, those are also a good value. You know, you don't get the hyper threading, obviously, you get less cash. Um, you know, they don't run into as high of clock speeds, but you know, they're still a great value for the money that you're paying for them. So it's all gonna depend. What is your budget? What kind of work are you doing? Keep that in mind. So we're gonna go with the i7-3770. As for cooling, we're not really all too concerned. It's a locked processor, so it's not gonna put out that much heat, um, but at the same time, you still want something that's gonna make it not cook itself, so this stock Intel cooler is gonna do perfectly fine. As for the power supply, it's really just gonna come down to, you know, whatever you can, have your ha you can get your hands on that's gonna ensure that you have enough power. Um, I had this Seasonic, I think this is like a five, 550 or a 520 or something. This is just laying around. Um, so th this will work fine. You know, Seasonic, Seasonic, they make awesome power supplies. So uh, I am not worried about this thing delivering enough power. Um, the board can certainly handle plenty of power. So I am not worried about power delivery at all. Uh, it's gonna be nice and it's gonna be efficient. So. Storage is very, very straightforward. I have a SanDisk uh, 240 gig SSD. Um, it does have a DRAM cache, so it's gonna be pretty snappy. Um, this board does not support NVMe, so I just went with a normal SATA SSD. I'm gonna put Linux on this. If you want Windows, put Windows on it. Um, very simple and straightforward, whatever you need. I wouldn't really recommend splurging on something very high capacity, because I mean, at least for me, a lot of my projects are gonna be on GitHub and uh, Google Drive and wherever you can do cloud-based storage. But uh, if you wanna get some cheaper hard drives to store all your uh, files, all your projects, that's perfectly fine too. But uh, for our purposes, I just need the 240 gig SSD. I'm gonna put Linux Mint on here and uh, pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, next we have our uh, memory, our RAM, and we're gonna go with four by four gigs for a total of 16. Uh, these are just what I had, and uh, they're also pretty affordable. Uh, if you wanna splurge on the uh, eight gig DIMMs, you can do that. I think that'll run you about maybe 100 to 150 if you shop around. Um, the Xeon board had eight slots, so we would've been able to go for 32 if I had more of these. Um, but the board that we're working with only has four, so we're kinda limited. Uh, so we're going to go with 16 gigs RAM. That should be more than plenty. Um, if you find that you're using more than that, uh, you might want to splurge on the higher modules or maybe go with a Xeon if you can get a board for it. Um, but we're just going to go with 16 for the sake of this build. Now we get to the part that I think most of you are probably very interested in. Um, and this part's going to be very, very uh, dependent on your budget and depending on your needs. 
So let's talk about our graphics card. So I'm putting this in the system only because I already have one. Um, this is the R9 390. This came out in, I believe, 2015. And when this thing came out, this was like the best card that AMD had to offer at the time. So, um, you know, it, it doesn't really hold up to today's GPUs, certainly. But, I mean, for getting some work done, you know, editing some videos, if I want to play a game or two, which is not what this is for, but it can certainly do it. Um, it's a very, very capable card. Uh, this actually was my uh, daily driver card for a while until I upgraded my rig. But um, if we look, we have a DisplayPort HDMI and two DVI connectors. So let's talk about the graphics card. Let's talk about what you want to do for graphics. So a graphics card, a used graphics card is going to cost you some money. Probably if you want a decent one, it's going to cost you in the neighborhood of around maybe 150 to uh, 250 something like that. Now, uh, these go on eBay for around $200, I believe. It's really going to come down to your workflow. Do you need something that can supply, you know, heavier duty graphics? Because, think about it, if you're programming, this is like just people who are learning, you know, uh, introductory programming languages, and 99% of the time you're just in the terminal, you don't really need graphics. You know, you can just hit compile and your CPU is going to take care of all the work because coding is not a graphics intensive process. So you might want to just save $200, nix the graphics card, and just use the onboard um, uh, video on your CPU. Because remember, we have an i7 and those things shipped with pretty sophisticated integrated graphics. Certainly not going to play GTA 5 at 4K or whatever, but it's certainly going to uh, do you well for just programming in the terminal. Uh, now, if we went with a Xeon, they don't have integrated graphics, so if you went with a Xeon, you would have to get something. Um, probably nothing too beefy, but you would have to have some kind of video output for it, so you'd have to get something. But again, if you want to do, you know, SolidWorks or 3D modeling or something like that, it might be a more graphically intensive process and you're probably going to need some more horsepower. So again, you really need to analyze what your workflow is and what you need out of your system. If you need graphics, get a graphics card, maybe don't go as hardcore on the CPU. Uh, if you're doing programming or something more CPU intensive, you know, think about do I need a lot of graphics horsepower or can I get by on the integrated graphics? So it's all a balancing act. It's all about, you know, how much system do you want, how much system do you need, and then how much system can you can you afford um, is, is, is what you have to consider. So we're going to go with the R9 390 and Frankly, for what I'm going to be using this system for, this should be overkill, uh, but it's nice to have. And then finally, we have the case, which you guys should be familiar with. I don't have it sitting right here, but you should know it because I did a video on it uh, a little while ago. It should be right up here in the corner. Um, it's the Corsair Carbide 175R. It's going to be able to provide decent airflow. It's going to house all of our components, and um, it's a great budget case and it's going to suit our needs perfectly fine. So that was kind of my rundown of all of our parts. So what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to prep the board and uh, I'm going to get everything installed and we'll show you the final product after everything's done. All right, so let's go ahead and get the motherboard prepped. I already inspected the socket. Um, looks absolutely pristine, no bent or damaged pins. So let's go ahead and set our CPU inside. So we'll find where the little triangle is.
and there we are. All right, so that is a prepped motherboard. Next, I'm going to install the RAM. One thing I wanted to bring attention to on this case, uh, I got these three uh, 120 millimeter fans from uh, up here. Um, these I got because they were cheap, pretty much. They're just they're three fans for, gosh, I think 15 or 12 dollars. It was very, very reasonably priced. Um, and I just have the three. I mounted them uh, in the front of the case. So what these are going to act as is these are going to pull in cold air and they're going to bring it through the case and then the rear fan right here is going to act as an exhaust so it's going to help push the hot air out. Um, the rear fan is actually the LED Corsair fan that was originally right here uh, but I moved it so that I could have these three fans up here to act as an intake. Um, you know if, if you're, you're probably not going to need to do this but I just wanted to First of all, I wanted to give it a try and, and see how it was to install this kind of configuration. But you know, for something, you know, it's a, a locked processor, we're probably not gonna be producing too much heat. Um, but you know, it never hurts to have more cooling than necessary. Um, but if you don't want it to make more noise, which more fans are definitely gonna add, you maybe consider just skipping out on the fans. Also, it's an increased cost, and even though they're pretty cheap, you know, $15 is $15, so. All right, so now I'm going to get the motherboard installed into the case. And then off screen, uh, I'm not gonna show it because it's not necessary. I'm gonna install the power supply and get all the cables routed. And that is an installed motherboard. So I'm going to install the power supply off screen and I'm gonna get all the cables routed in. For the SSD, uh, we just take this little cage off the back here and then we align it with the holes on the back of the SSD and simply screw them in. All right, so it was a pain, but I got everything hooked up to the power supply. So it should just be the final thing to do is install our graphics card into our PCIe 16X slot. And uh, we should be ready to boot up some Linux and take this thing for a test drive. All right, I'm gonna get all the cables managed and I'll give you one last look at it before we start to power it on. 
All right. It's done. That took like 50,000 zip ties, but we got it. I'm not going to pry off the back and show you the cable management because frankly, there almost is none. Corsair, I love you, but when you make a, like a budget case, cable management is not like an exclusive feature. Just saying. But yeah, uh, I like to think that the front, I mean, I think it looks pretty clean, guys. So, I'm going to get it plugged in. Let's see if it turns on. Oh, she turned on, guys. She turned on. Okay. So, here we are. Um, so, we had a bit of a problem at first, but I've at least gotten part of the way done. So, here's what happened. So when I first turned on the machine, the motherboard had this red LED light. And I like, um, it was good on Asus to do this. There are several LEDs around the motherboard to tell you what parts of it are bad. Um, so what was happening was it did not like the memory that uh, I gave it. So what I ended up doing was taking out the CMOS battery uh, putting it back in, and then only using one stick of RAM uh, to try and get into the BIOS. So as you can see, we're here. Uh, we got to put in a keyboard and mouse. But as you can see, it detects our Core i7-3770 at 3.4 gigahertz. Um, we got the 4 gigs, because that's just the one stick of uh, DRAM that I have in there. Uh, you can see the BIOS is from 2012. Uh, it's not detecting any drives, keyboards, and mice, and the red LED has moved to the SATA ports. So it's probably not detecting my boot device, which means I'm probably going to have to try plugging it into different places. So that should be fun. But we are one step closer. So let me go get a keyboard and mouse, and uh, we'll see if we can get into the BIOS and run a setup here. All right, so we're in the BIOS, we're in setup. Just look at how cool this BIOS looks. Um, yeah, this was pretty advanced back from uh, for 2012. Yeah, man, this is awesome. Uh, so let's go to boot menu and see if it can see my... Okay, so it does detect my uh, SanDisk. Um, so if I boot from that, well, yeah, if I... Why is it giving me two options here? I don't understand that. So let's just go for the first one. Reboot and select proper boot device. And here we are. This is the Linux Mint desktop screen. So unfortunately, it uh, I was able to get the memory issue resolved, and I was able to get into the BIOS. However, I think... I don't know what it was, something corrupted my partition. So I had to do a fresh install of Mint. Um, not the biggest deal in the world, but it was just kind of annoying. Um, but it's working, we're all good. Um, uh, there were no problems that I could detect. Everything is detected fine, CPU, RAM, everything's good. So yeah, we're 100% good. <sighs> and there we have it. We have a finished PC. I checked to make sure everything's working. It's beautiful. We are good to go. So, uh, for final specs, we got an i7-3770, an R9-390, 16 gigs of DDR3 RAM at 1600 megahertz. And I'll be honest, it looks pretty dope for what it is. So, all told, with how much the parts would cost um, using average eBay pricing because some of this is going to be hard or expensive to find new. Uh, we're looking right around the five to six hundred dollar mark. Uh, if you want to up your graphics card, it might be a little bit more. Um, you know, if you want to go to a newer processor, maybe the 4000 series, which is a different socket, uh, that might run you a little bit more, but you know. Five to six hundred dollars looks like it's gonna be the sweet spot, and I guarantee you, 
this is going to do so much more if you want to do programming or CAD applications. This will do so much more work for you than a laptop in that price range. So hopefully you all found this helpful. You know, this is not the de facto parts list. There's going to be some variation in there. Um, this was just kind of a guide or an example of what you could do with some slightly older hardware and you could still make a pretty nice work computer for it. Uh, you're not going to be playing the AAA video games at the highest settings or anything, but that's not what this is for. This is for getting some work done. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty proud of it. I'm proud that everything works good. I'm proud that I'm proud that I built a good machine, so yeah. Uh, hopefully you all found this video somewhat informative, somewhat entertaining. Um, if so, please leave a like and subscribe. Very much appreciate it. Thank you again for watching. If you want to see me try out any applications with this, or if you have any ideas for other uh, components that would have been good that I probably should have used, leave them down in the comments. Uh, other than that, yeah, thanks again for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time.